18% of sample. Zbik Ho. The Martian Odyssey, Terra Martialis. Kindle Edition. Prologue Sol 22 Planum Borium. Marek Woznicka was known throughout the world as Mark Woznitsky, but by the many friends he left behind in a distant world was simply Mark or Marek when they were cross with him. He was gliding gently down the slope that vanished at the horizon in the amber gold glow of rare, feathery clouds which were shining brightly. In the sunshine, rays were falling on the back of this lone skier and shining out from time to time as a bright riot of rainbow colors in the eyes of an imaginary observer. Imaginary, because on the whole planet there was no one who could enjoy this phenomenon. An even more shocking impression would be created by the dynamics of this image to such an observer. It would be some miracle if he managed to do that through the emptiness of over a hundred million kilometers, and he managed to obtain sufficient resolution to see this dot's lightly winding track. He would have seen the dot marking a dynamic route on the endless desert stretches. The dot would seem extremely slow from the distance, while at the place movement was at a breakneck speed for ski trekking. At moments like this at times this speed even reached 40 km per hour, gliding over small humps of slides down this hill's gently curvature over several kilometers. However, the eyesight of our lone traveler was focused on himself only and the equally gentle lines of hills appearing on the horizon. All his attention seemed to be focused on maintaining balance in this dynamic flight over a dazzling myriad of sandy sparks smoothed by the wind and sun in an area of perennial ice sheet. The material was the only one of its kind in the whole solar system, an unusual mixture of dry ice and rusty red dust, affixed there by the raging regularity of the southerly sandstorms. It is this gold dust embedded in the structure of the ice that gave to it its peculiar amber golden color, wherever the wind and the sun coupled with the thin layers of recent snowfall. As a result, all the exposed expanses of ice gleamed like a polished amber mountain, which is a color of ice never seen on Earth, and no one would associate the color with this shade of icy space. However, the majority of the ice areas were covered with few millimeters of snow layers from previous snowfalls. These had fallen earlier, before the weeks and months formed a perfect binder for the recently dropped ultra-thin layer of snow. The pair of skis glided over it like a dream, squeezing a shallow, millimeter-thick trace of two parallel paths removed by force of wind, a layer of the exposed, polished surface stretched broadly. The surface persisted for many kilometers of the snow dune blankets. And it was here that Mark carefully chose the route for his run. Lots of larger fragments of quartz dust shone like miniature mirrors from the same surface area of the exposed expanses of ice when the sun's rays fell on their smooth cut and polished crystal planes. They threw a myriad of happy, colorful, random, bouncing light bunnies on the whitish surface. At such times it reminded one of a flowery meadow in early spring. It was like last year's dry grass, dotted with snowdrops, primroses and crocuses stretching to the horizon and bathed in the sunlight. The sun sparkled also on the freshly fallen snowflakes. However, these shimmering, Joyful reflections were just as treacherous as the glittering snow in blinding the unwary in spite of the 50% greater distance from the sun. The role of protective eyewear was met here with the mask of his lightweight space helmet having a photochromic layer. It was strapped tightly to cover Mark's shoulders and inconspicuously fitted his flexible spacesuit, which was an iridescent metallic, dark olive in color, changing at a specific angle into black. His light brown shoes had contrasting yellow bundled appliques in the shape of two stylized letters that together forming the letter M for Mars. The shoes were bound to the legs of the spacesuit via flexible oval orifices and were fastened the skis with narrow ski bindings of a metallic golden color. His skis were in a sharply competing color, distinguished clearly by their blue pigment. Their tops were crowned with the stylized rockets forming the letter M only when the ski boards were at the correct angle to each for a run. AA meant an accident was imminent. Long titanium poles, the same color as the skis, 
reached to Mark's armpits and ended in solid circles with three corrugated blades. He used these to steadily drive through the ice, which was covered with several ultra-thin layers of dense snow from recent snowfalls, to give additional momentum and compensate for inaccuracies in his balance. This prevented any unpleasant tipper, which could result in injury and consequently even death. Mark preferred not to think about this sort of consequence too often, due to his obvious inability to get any help out here. And the constant presence of danger accompanied him on every step from dawn to dusk each polar day. And literally anything could kill him here. Low temperatures. A gulp of thin gases ready to turn the blood in his body into a soda siphon. Lack of oxygen. Lack of water. Or even just a few days delay in reaching the stocks to which he currently aimed at his mad pace. The drop happened seven days earlier, but the delivery landed more than 350 kilometers west of his base, east of Chasma Boale, on the seventh degree of Martian longitude east and close to 85 degree north. His base camp was positioned almost exactly on meridian 50 and the 84th parallel of north latitude and was now 200 kilometers behind him. Every day he managed to beat the designated 50 km stage in spite of all the difficulties arising from the terrain bumps and the movements restricting his breathing through his flexible suit. Occasionally he could enjoy the rush of the thin air over the deflectors of his helmet and the uniform noise of his skis sliding over the icy ground. He enjoyed the feeling of smooth flight as he experienced during the course of a descent like this and down the slope of yet another hill which was leading straight ahead. His descent needed only a light effort, almost imperceptible body actions, which were transformed into gentle curves, allowing him to effortlessly bypass any obstacles that were visible from afar, or select the path which was optimal in his opinion. He smiled mentally to himself though his thin dark blonde face and grey-blue eyes never changed from a neutral expression under the chromatic shelter of his helmet. Then a sudden jerk and sharp rasp under his left ski knocked him both out of a momentary reverie and out of balance. He cried inwardly and, holding his breath, began violently trying to balance his body by raising the right ski skywards. Somehow he managed to stay on both feet, as had happened many times before. However, he lost nearly half his momentum and was now cursing silently at his carelessness. He began to restore a normal rate of descent by pushing vigorously with both poles to attain subsequent rapid slalom movements. The ski straps on the heels for trekking allowed both safe exit and after the release of the rear latches a normal pace in flat terrain or an arduous climb up small slopes. After a while, he again darted down at speeds of up to 30 km per hour. He wondered what would have happened had he brushed against that protruding edge just above the surface of the stone when developing speeds greater than 40 km per hour. Because it certainly was not a small stone. As gravity was one third of that on Earth and as there was an extremely low friction with the fine mixture of dry ice and ordinary ice, the pressure of the sliding skis acted down on a thin layer of lubricant and immediately behind him froze up and created two bright whitish parallel lines which disappeared behind the horizon in the direction from which he had come. In fact, gravity here was so weak that he had successfully managed to move on skis even after a partial frost occurred on the surface of volatile Martian sand mixed with moisture deposited from the atmosphere, like morning dew on Earth. And here the wet grains of dust were intimately bound together in an instant icy grip. When he was forced to run along such a surface, the film that had broken beneath him crunched on the run, and this time left a darkened double trace from the exposed, loose layer. He owed much to the specific skis he used being based on Kevlar, reinforced with diamond nanofibers and a graphene surface. This was the latest fashion, which combined the composite's low resistance to wear with flexibility, and most importantly, with an extremely low coefficient of friction, both on the dry ice and even on ordinary sand. Polyparaphenylene terephthalamide is better known as Kevlar, because it is so much easier to say. The Polish version was named Mevla, which was more marketable than the chemical name, 
that I am not permitted to reveal. Prototype of these special skis had been designed and tested specifically for this trip by the Department of Low Temperatures named after Peter Kapitza at the Silesian Institute of Solids. Built according to Mark's guidelines, they were able to fare equally well over different ice surfaces. So, during the Mars expedition the lab gained instant fame and earned a well-deserved place as the prominent ski producer of the world. This significantly increased the magnitude of the bank accounts of its producers, creators, as well as its originators. At least my family will still receive some benefit from me, Mark thought wistfully. There is only a modest chance of my rescue and returning out of here, he added silently, clearly without any note of bitterness. He had experienced here too much and for too long already, trying to survive, to allow this type of reflection come to him and knock him off balance. Mark's father had died a few years before Mark was selected for the first interplanetary attempt of the International Space Agency, ISA, as commander of a four-person Mars expedition. It was the familiar-sounding Polish abbreviation for ISA, namely MAK, from the Polish, Medzinrodowa Agencia Kosmiczna, that drew Mark to the idea of an in-memoria emblem for the whole mission. It was based on a simple poppy flower, which translates just as Mac into Polish. Mark was born in Katowice in 2004. It was the year of Polish entry into the European Union. And when he graduated from the Silesian University of Technology, his father watched his successes and further progress with increasing pride. First, he was at the Institute of Engineering and Aviation. Later, as he was one of the designers of new Polish machines and also their first pilot in a single person. In at the end he passed the stringent selection screening for ISA astronauts. They honed their skills at the third international space station. Finally dad looked forward to the time when his son had become the first Pole, together with a Russian, to put foot on the moon and plant a pole with the European Union flag on it. All this was within the first pan-European manned mission which succeeded with a landing and safe return from another celestial body. So it happened that this expedition was only the prelude, test and training before the first European mission to the Mars. As a result, he and no one else was now here on these shining icy sands under a foreign sky. The icy sands might be deadly, but so far had been surprisingly favorable for him so far. The slightly corrugated polar plains of Mars were the borderland between Planum Boreum and Vastitis Borealis. It was precisely on the part of the border referred to as Olympia Planum. He was also aware that he was the first man here. Although the Americans actually landed on Mars first, beating at fierce competition from China, neither the former nor the latter never ever approached the polar regions with a manned expedition. Mark fumbled in the drawers of his memory for recent history facts on how the Pan-EU grew. History was not his specialist area, but he remembered the following basics from his own life. A revision to the politico-constitutional standards for determining admission to the Pan-EU worked wonders. Participation in the Pan-EU grew slowly, but steadily, with the inclusion into its structure of more and more new countries. After the incorporation of Canada, India and Japan and the inclusion of Russia, this phenomenon took on the nature of an avalanche. Especially so when almost all of South America was incorporated in one fell swoop. Cartoonists of the day called it one swell foop. In the aftermath, a marginalized China and the US were the only significant islands remaining to prevent the Pan-EU from being renamed the World Union. Nevertheless, it was initially renamed AEU, then AAEU, and ended up as A3EU after two intermediary stages of being called A cubed, or A3 as most of the countries in Asia, Africa and America enrolled, thus enhancing its importance. Only the poorest and most anarchic of them were still outside with no real chance to enter this structure in a reasonable time scale. They could not shake off the ballast of a bygone era even when tempted with wide-ranging help by the Pan-EU. Landing on Olympus Mons in 2039 ensured the success of the US space program 
on the basis of restoring and properly upscaling and upgrading the technology of the Apollo lunar landers of 1969 to 1973. However, while the landing on the moon occurred just 12 years after the onset of the space age in 1957 by the Russian Sputnik, the first manned landing on Mars was to take longer to achieve. The breakthrough was in assembling NASA's entire complex of Mars mods. These were modules for Mars that were placed in initial Earth orbit to take advantage of smaller launches than the famous Saturn V technology. This solution was picked up by other participants in the Martian race, that is the ISA, JAXA and the Russian, Indian and Chinese space agencies. The first four had established a close technical cooperation in this area long before they formed the Great Pan-EU. The process clearly showed how cooperation in space technologies can become the key enabler for integration on a much broader scale. The Americans landed in the crater, one edge of which is the highest point on Mars, rising to a height of more than 21 km, and therefore lying practically in free space comparable to that on the Moon. Due to the low gravitational attraction, the atmosphere of Mars is less extensive than that of Earth. The atmospheric pressure at the level of the plains is less than 1% of the Earth's and ranges from 6 hectopascal to only about 1 hectopascal slightly less than 1 kilometer above the edge of Olympus Mons. This means that the atmospheric pressure on Mars drops logarithmically by a factor of about 2.73 with each 11 kilometers of height. It also means that the air on the rim of the Olympus Mons caldera is a thousandfold lower than at the Earth's surface. Thus, the landing could take place there with the use of a classic spider-shaped lander, characterized in the ancient lunar module, with a no-descent phase using parachutes. The base of the lander module provided the starting platform for returning home, and it remained in the crater after the completion of the mission, serving for many years as an automatic weather station which transferred data from devices distributed over the surface by the astronauts. They also left there their two Mars rovers, similar to Spirit, Opportunity and Curiosity from the beginning of the century, but converted to work in a fully automatic mode which wallowed for many years over the length and breadth of the crater until every inch of its surface had been thoroughly photographed and studded and imprinted with traces of their wheels. After this expedition the crater was never quite the same, from space it looked like an erratically ploughed field. The crater landing won the Americans the race to Mars, ahead of the Chinese. The Chinese had followed quickly on the heels of the Americans. Just two years later they successfully copied the feat, but elsewhere. And in following the footsteps of the Americans they showed, however, a much more developed practical sense. As the object of their research, they had chosen the almost as high Tharsis Mantis. In China the landing site was colloquially known as meaning, paintball target, based on the beautiful colorful false color topographic map of the area provided free of charge by NASA many years before their manned mission. Paintball Target Nearly two years after NASA's feat, their manned ship was firmly seated in a small shallow basin adjacent to the northern edge of the crater Pavonis Mons. It turned out to be a practical bullseye. They were not imprisoned in a crater like the Americans, who were stuck to their Rodeo circuit in the Caldera crater's dust. The next two missions went off every half a year by maneuvering the startup windows in an unprecedented way. China managed to establish a permanent manned station next to the crater Pavonis. They arranged regular forays with Martian vehicles into the adjacent lowlands, where they founded a small, fully autonomous base, able to give shelter to Tychonauts arriving there from the mother station at the edge of the crater. They called it Flower Station Pavonis by Ju Yi in honor of their legendary poet. The numerous subsidiary stations that subsequently sprouted appropriately obtained their names from flowers mentioned in ancient Chinese poetry.
In subsequent missions, they made a series of daring expeditions into Narctis Labyrinthus at the edge of Syria Planum and west of the Vales Marineris, which was penetrated years ago by a European probe. A year before the ISIS first and so far only manned mission of this pan-European agency to the Red Planet, China suspended the operation of its stations, focusing rather on preparing the first manned expedition in history to the moons of Jupiter. The Chinese left hordes of automatic rovers on Mars, which were designed to crawl all over all the plains surrounding Pavones. Some of them reached all the way to Sinai Planum, which in consequence was often slyly called Sinai Planum. What the Chinese discovered there remained their jealously guarded secret. But on the eve of the start of Japanese Indo-European expedition led by Mark, they approved an astronomical expenditure, in two senses, for a restart and expansion of Pavoni's stock. Flying to Mars, Mark led fruitless debates with his fellow travelers about the reasons for that budget. Why did China plan to spend 5% of their gross budget every year over a 10-year period? just for research on Mars. Within the framework of the Chinese Red Dragon project, which they had already started, intensive preparatory work had already began for the construction of a multi-kilometer mountain railway system, intended to ensure continuous communication with the system of bases designed at the foot of Pavoni's Mons. Unlike the US, China did not show at that time any intention of giving up its ambitious plans with respect to Jupiter's moons. Coming back to the NASA, a spectacular feat of the American Space Agency turned out to be not only its swan song, but a nail in the coffin of the once sole superpower. It was greatly weakened by the Second Sixteen Years' War, as they called their years of bloody military involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan after 2001 and simply could not bear the costs of a new space race. America was no longer able to meet the challenges imposed by the Chinese economy. Space exploration, they had gradually passed into the hands of private consortia, which are still limiting their targets for organizing trips to low orbits of the Earth. In similar way, the next cosmic power was affected by the same kind of economic crisis and shared the same fate as the former. However, Russia gave its full experience in space research as a dowry to the ISA. For it was the Russian cosmonaut, Alexei Dobrowolsky, who was able to land on Mars, along with his friend the Pole in the first truly international, manned, interplanetary mission. Work on the combined, Euro-Indo-Japanese Martian program gained momentum in the year 2029 only after Russia was included in the EU, renamed Pan-EU. Or, as Russian used to say, after incorporating the European Union kindergarten into the Great Mother Russia. Invigorating cash came like an untamed flood to the Russian contractors' offices. In less than 10 years, the project to make a universal Mars lander was developed. It was tested first in a low Earth orbit flights. Then to the moon where the Russian lunar landers included Mark Voznitsky, pilots Alan McNeil and Alexei Dobrovolsky and navigator Hubert Voigt. And finally Russia was on Mars. There was a successful automated landing in Vales Marineris on Christmas 2039. This was combined with the delivery of an entire fleet of automated probes riding on and flying over Mars. The probes precisely documented the entire set of morphologically differentiated surroundings of this complex of Valors and the Valors themselves. For more than three years, they transmitted a virtual avalanche of color footage from high-resolution cameras to the eight specially selected channels of the mainstream cable networks of the PAN-TV's solar system, SolSIUS, Super Internet. The global communication system coverage was of all stations, together with the ISS-2 and bases on the moon. They already foresaw future bases at other planets. Their network included also the whole of the traditional terrestrial internet, currently benefiting from the introduction of optical fiber connections with an extremely low attenuation of the order of one thousandth part of a decibel per kilometer. Among the flotilla of vehicles placed on Mars on this occasion, first violin was played again by some small rovers of Polish construction. Since the first failures of the ESA Martian landers at the beginning of the century, 
These were the ones that reigned supreme on Mars, next to the US robots in the 20s. It all began in the spring of 2010 when the Magma Space Robot was built by Polish students. The students were from Bialystok Technical University and the Nicholas Copernicus University in Torun. They cooperated with the Mars Society of Poland and seized third place in the University Rover Challenge competitions run in the Utah desert. Not only that, but of a dozen entries reaching the finals, the Polish entry was the only one from Europe. It was an event which one of the constructors of Magma, Wojciech Glazewski, who later became Mark's university lecturer, related many times. It was a real challenge. We were only beaten by teams that collaborated with NASA. What was equally important was that Magma turned out to be the lightest. Its mass was only 35 kilograms. There was, therefore, no surprise that on the basis of this and other Polish endeavors, the first successful unmanned missions of the European Space Agency, ESA, to Mars were realized. Also, the lander of the present first international manned mission to Mars had to provide a Polish construction vehicle that had been successfully tested earlier in a manned mission to the Lunar Sea of Tranquility. Two years after a test flight to the Moon, it was marked with indescribable pride of his countrymen and his unfeigned surprise, who was selected as the commander of the first international manned flight to Mars. He was accompanied by Alexei Dobrowolski, the pilot of the lander, the Indian Aziz Swaminathan, the first pilot, and the Japanese Natsu Yasunari, who was cast in the dual role of navigator and telecoms operator. The fact that both Mark and Alexei flew to Mars indicated that their joint lunar mission had a clear training purpose in which they fully demonstrated the expectations placed upon them. Now came their turn to simply repeat the test landing of the moon on Mars. The test differed from landing on Mars merely by the absence of parachutes and ablation shields on the lander, and of course even less gravity. Later, the training would suffice to guarantee an equally successful launch from the surface of Mars and a docking this time in the orbit around Mars. For them it should have been piece of cake. During the lunar mission, they had both complemented each other perfectly. This was greatly facilitated by Mark's fluent Russian. As with the other crew members before, they had to communicate in English. Aziz and Natsum may have been disappointed because the flight plan did not call for them get to land on Mars. Neither allowed any jealousy to cross through their minds. They had a job to do. Little did they know. Simultaneous launches occurred from the famous territory of Baikonur and from the spaceport at Kourou. French Guiana. In the middle of the previous year, a record audience of more than 70% of the possible audience in the A3EU had gathered in front of their screens. He clearly remembers today the emotion which came over him when parting with his wife Mariana and their 12-year-old daughter Dobroslava. After an anxious wait, there was the launch itself. First the two triple-manned rockets were ignited and then, after an interval of two hours, the huge transport rocket. This launch was necessary to carry into orbit an essential module for their interplanetary mission. After a successful docking, they joined Natsum on the deck via the Human Transport Vehicle HTV, piloted by their colleague Alan McNeil. Alan ushered them aboard the Tsiolkovsky and regretfully parted with them. For, after visiting and checking their rooms on the ship, his commission was to return to the cabin of the HTV and return to Earth. A few minutes later, Tsiolkovsky was docked into Soyuz TM with Aziz and Alexei. Now it contained the friend of Alexei, Vera Patsayev who was the granddaughter of an astronaut killed in the final phase of the already long-forgotten expedition of Soyuz 11. She also could not easily leave the Earth Fort Tsiolkowski. She even said, in Russian of course, just think about it. Tsiolkovsky, and he's the only Russian on the Russian vehicle. It's not fair, it's just him. She concluded, it is time to return back to home, sweet Earth. Nardavoz Rashchat Sire, which sounded like she was swearing in frustration.
As a consolation, they made Vera a pennant emblazoned with the emblem of the expedition and signed by all crew members. Alexei solemnly promised to her that he would also smuggle back for her a beautiful stone from Mars. Only then did Natsume give Vera a nudge towards to the hold of the Soyuz TM. Reluctantly she fired its engines, unmoored, blew them a kiss through the window, while much of her was visible through the viewport. For a long time Alexei could not get over how well she managed to maneuver, simultaneously detaching and appearing in the orbital cabin's window to wave them goodbye. Here's to seeing you again, he muttered appreciatively. Wow, is she a woman, he added loudly. Then it was their turn to unseal the control systems of the ship and leave the orbit. When they finally accelerated the ship and put it on the trajectory to Mars, Natsume placed herself sideways to the direction of flight, and they could spend hours in succession with their noses stuck to the two portholes. First the blue planet was the size of the moon as seen from the Earth, then in a few days it changed into the brightest star after the sun. Sol 1, the eye of the standard schnauzer. He emerged from the abyss into a bright honey glow. He closed his eyes. In his head was noise like a hundred thousand barbarians in full attack. Half of them had mounted an assault on his upper neck. With difficulty he caught a few brief breaths, for it seemed as if someone was painfully pressing on his chest every time he tried to take his next breath. Carefully he inhaled air and slowly opened his eyes. His eyes were now looking through an amazingly bright slot of light shining directly on the ambered, snow desert. For a moment he looked quite blankly at the unearthly view. However, after a while, he became fully aware of what had happened and what he saw. With some effort he turned his head and found that the visor of his helmet was resting on the remnants of a control panel. He moved his hand first one, then the other. He had freedom of movement on each side of the body. So, he pulled up his hands to his shoulders, supporting himself with them on the surface of the panel and tried to throw off the devil on his back who does not allow him to breathe. Millimeter by millimeter the unbearable burden shifted upwards. Now he could take a deep full breath. And another. He pressed the panel under him strongly with his hands. Suddenly the gap in his right field of vision began to expand rapidly. At the same time, he felt that some powerful force had thrown him into this glowing space, turning him with an increasing speed, as in a slow motion movie. He heard the roar when the duraluminum plate hit, with a thud on the edge of his left side and with prolongated whiz. He began a slide further down until, with loud bump, he struck something in the path. He revolved with vigor around its bottom edge and got raised up in the air with it. The final pounding cord coincided with an instant of freedom, but in fact it was a new kind of slavery. Above him zigzagged the light brown, cloudless sky, darkening toward the center. In the darkening center, he saw some of the brightest stars arranged to form the familiar constellation of the Big Dipper. This dipper, however, moved abruptly and begins to scatter contents to the left, to the right. Now a growing noise of flapping wings was like the proud clucking of a gigantic hen sitting on a child's swing. Moments later an angry storm of ice shards and feather-like snow built up on his helmet's visor and completely obscured his vision. Helpless and limp, he panted for a moment and slid down the hill, as if he was on a big sleigh carrying him to a new point of equilibrium. Then eventually his momentum slowed, and after a few hundred meters of slowing down, he stopped gently. For a moment he lay completely still, afraid to move a muscle. Then he decided to slowly wipe his visor, scooping the snow with his spacesuit glove. He turned his head to the left to face away from the intolerable glare beaming in from the right. A gentle line of undulating hills that ran down from the horizon, bringing to mind the colored sands of the Sahara. Above them, in the background, are a few ragged clouds, stuck to the wavy line of the horizon, and lit by an orange sky in a riot of all shades of pink and purple. 
Using all his willpower, he tried to refocus now on his position. He looked forward, lifting his head, and saw his knees in the spacesuit up against the skyline. He ignored this for a moment. With surprising lightness, he moved his hands and managed to find the buckles of the straps fixing him to the chair. The latches freed him with a loud metallic clank. He moved his knees and with both hands grabbed the jutting edge of the seat of his chair. He pulled himself up in a single motion. But for another long instant, he kneeled with his knees hunched apart around the seat back's frame, holding onto the edge. He was in a position resembling a dead Mayan warrior squashed onto the available space on the face of a tombstone in Palenque. Still stunned he glared at the slope that appeared before him. Only after another long pause could he bring himself to analyze the view of complete chaos and destruction that was. In front, the sun was low on the horizon on his right. He looked back along the track where a few moments earlier his accidental sleigh ride traversed almost the entire slope from the summit to the base of the hill. And in front of him in a dazzling shades of amber, dozens of small or large dark spots or dots were dispersed. Some of them cast long, dark carmine shadows. Some surfaces glisten in the blinding sun. His spaceship was nowhere to be seen, not counting a small spot crowning just below the horizon. The spot was close to the start of the path, that was carved by his slide on the section of the floor on which he now sat. He now understood that the spot was much smaller than others in the neighborhood. Then he realized that all these darkening objects he was looking at were parts of his spaceship. The ship, or rather what's left of it, was everywhere far in front of him. He rose carefully and, still leaning, held with one hand onto the edge of the seat cushion attached to the rectangular portion of the shell. The size of the shell on which he was now standing uncertainly, with his legs wide apart, was merely one and a half by two meters. Hesitantly he moved one foot to the other side of the seat's back and balanced for a moment on the edge of the panel. The panel swayed dangerously under him, forcing him to give a rapidly leap sideways, straight into the snow-covered surface. By virtue of his momentum, he took three more slippery steps and stopped, hardly catching his balance. He stood on the frozen surface that was covered with fresh snow to a height of a few millimeters. Just ahead of his feet, he could clearly see individual, shimmering, amber snowflakes, often more than a centimeter in size, creating an airy, loose structure on the hard, crusted surface immediately beneath it. With his boot's toe he kicked at this surface with interest. Under the layer of fluff it differed little in consistency from a path trodden by a constant stream of passers-by in snow on a concrete sidewalk. Hesitantly, he moved uphill along the path left by his accidental sleigh ride. And after a long time, he approached the first group of darkening snow objects. Shell fragments and loose packs lay in the amber-pink snow, scattered around over tens of square meters. Many packs had suffered a complete fracture and their contents had dispersed, tracing their paths with their meteoric tails pointing up towards the top of the hill. Suddenly he remembered the intercom. He pressed a button on his sleeve to call his colleague. There was no response. Only electrostatic discharges in the ether. Frantically he began to search the rubble, scanning it with his eyes. Nothing. He moved ahead towards the top of the hill. Overcoming these 200 meters up the slippery slope took him a good half an hour. Along the way, he doubted whether he would ever have succeeded with this trick if the inclination of the slope was not so slight. In the end he arrived upon the portion of the control panel, on which he woke up nearly an hour earlier. It included the upper part of the lander cabin, which was stuck to the middle of the ice. At least it looked like that at a first glance. Slowly he went around along its circumference. No, it was not protruding from the ice. The second half was just missing. The one he had before his eyes had somehow been retained on the ice by its sharp jagged edges. He saw now how he was able to throw off the chair with the whole heavy fragment of the floor along with himself. 
The desktop of the panel was inclined at an even greater angle than the slope. It was then enough that he slightly lost his balance. The rest of the work was done by gravity. With much effort he moved on, again towards the top of the hill. After a long time, the wreck of the capsule emerged in front of him like a distorted image of its cross-section. Broken stumps were detached from the base of the lander, and connectors protruded past the startup engine's nozzles, seeming to silently threaten the neutral sky. The second half of the capsule lay heavily angled, compressed under its base. He tried to understand what happened. Apparently, the lander capsule broke in two, and when the shock absorbers were crushed, the whole capsule broke away from the base of the lander. Then after rocketing up, it had rolled upside down, hitting its upper part into the hard ice. Part of the contents were strewn around the hillside behind him. The rest were literally crushed. Full of foreboding he began to walk around the split part, returning to the left side of the ship's capsule. He suddenly saw a glassy thin red line, only slightly thickened at the end, embedded in clear amber of the ice surface exposed by the blast of the collapse. He stood there for a long time and entranced looked at the frozen blood, fighting overwhelming waves of nausea. He knew that he could do nothing for his companion. But still he lunged forward and struggled for a long time with the jagged edges of the wreck. From this side, and then from the other side. Without any apparent result. The scrap heap did not budge even a millimeter. He took a few steps back and for a long while stood helpless, first staring at the wreckage of the capsule, then looking around. He breathed heavily behind his suit visor. After what seemed like an eternity, he moved on. In front, heavily driven into the ice, and folded like an accordion lay the remnants of the base of the lander. He walked around the shipwreck, and stopped at a protrusion from the porous ice wall in front of which was a pile of what was left of the rover attached to it. The light vehicle was a distant relative of the one once used on the moon during the last three Apollo expeditions. He could not stop thinking about the fact that his friend was nearby, next to him dead, buried under a pile of scrap metal. Though it was only him, his mastery, rapid decisions and repetitive training meant that what he did without thinking saved one life. And yet it was his companion who was killed. There is no doubt that his death was as swift as the twinkling of a star, he was the first victim offered to the planet called the God of War. He almost envied him at this point. He realized that his turn might come at any moment. How long could he survive here relying exclusively on himself? A day? At the top two. Soon he would run out of energy resources, and with them he faced the failure of his spacesuit's air regeneration package. He would die anyway, if not from lack of oxygen then from the lack of heating. Not to mention the need to eat and drink. And even if by some miracle he survived the week without water, if he did not have a place to take off his helmet, he would die of hunger. For the suit could supply only heat, water from purified Martian ice, and oxygen supplemented from hydrolysis. But he would not surrender. He mentally increased his furious determination, he would not give up without a fight. Alexei would certainly not wish him to surrender. Out. Stretched under him were vast tracts of eternal ice. From this perspective plane Emborium appeared, as a monstrous mouth of a bearded head of a standard schnauzer, with its tongue hanging out, bounded above by the empty, smooth spaces of Olympia planet. The imagined dog was reaching for his throat with its huge, white, furry head formed by Chasma Boale. Natsum Yasunari looked down towards the disappearing dot, after giving the control equipment the final adjustments necessary for a precise flight of the lander to the crater. A few minutes earlier, he had positioned this dot very accurately on the crater that bore the name of the mother ship, where he remained in Martian orbit together with Aziz, the first pilot. This dot was Lander Nord 2, 
which was in the vicinity of the planet's equator separated from Lomonosov. The dot flashed a faint glow. For a while it was hard to believe that this inconspicuous, now thin line, marked by a thin braid of ionized gases, carried people, and that they were going towards the brownish background surface. These two fragile sparks of life were two of his colleagues with whom he had lived, not just in the claustrophobic rooms of the spaceship during the last half year of flight, but also during the long months of preparations. The dot was now a fast fading black speck on the brink of disappearing far away on the boundless expanses of an eternal ice desert. Natsum is clearly seeing for only a few seconds a black dot moving rapidly toward the eye. The eye on their background was what they called the target landing point. This was ever since Alexei drew their attention to the unusual shape of the polar cap as viewed from the perspective of the Martian polar orbit. Then the small speck flared up violently as a faint red spark. Its color passed gradually to gaudy yellow and white, as thickening air masses were warmed up to a temperature many times the surface temperature of the sun. Also, together with the emergence of more and more plasma around the edges the ablation skin left behind glowing, vaporized material that acted like a cocoon to protect the precious kernel. The internal temperature never for a moment exceeded room temperature. After a second, the spark went out and the navigator breathed a sigh of relief. He knew that the leader parachute had just opened. At the same time, the raging storm of static in the ether stopped and he heard a loud and clear commander's voice open. The altitude is 18 kilometers at the standard rate of descent. And after a while, this is the second parachute. Altitude is 12 kilometers. Speed of sinking is 1.2 Mach, 1 Mach, 18, 15, 10, turn on the main parachute, now. And after a long time again, turn on the main parachute. And after another, long endless moment, an unearthly calm, main trigger mechanism, has failed, we fail on breaking, 0.95 Mach, 8,000 meters, blasts fired, ablative shield cover not separated. 0.90 H, 7,000 meters, 82 hundredths Mach, 6,000 meters, 76 hundredths, 5,000 meters, 72 hundredths, 4,000 meters, 7 tenths, 3,000 meters. He could hear the voice of Alexei, who asks for permission to include brake engines and immediately obtains the approval given by the deadpan voice of Mark. Brake engines included, shield is gone. And after a short while, goodbye guys. And that's all, nothing more, only silence and a throttling tightness in his throat. Goodbye guys, and he did not, could not choke out a word. They both slumped in the cockpit, and did not raise their eyes from the snowing screens for a long, long time. The Martian Odyssey, Terra Martialis, Kindle Edition. By clicking by now with one click, you agree to Amazon's Kindle Store Terms of Use, sold by Amazon.com Services LLC. This title and over one million more available with Kindle Unlimited.